This is an irreverent podcast. Check out irreverent.fm for shows from all our friends. Hello and welcome to Exvangelical. I'm your host, Blake Chastain. Happy 2019. It's good to be back. I hope your year is starting off well. Exvangelical went out on a high note last year, being featured on the CBS documentary Deconstructing My Religion and subsequently quoted in a Newsweek cover story in December. I'm happy to be back in the swing of things, though, providing more episodes for you here. So let's get right into it. My guest this week is Erin Green. She is the co-director of The Brave Commons, which is an organization dedicated to helping the LGBTQ student population on Christian college campuses across the country. In this interview, we talk about Erin's life, her own experiences on Christian campuses, and her involvement in negotiations with Azusa Pacific late last year. Azusa Pacific University made headlines last year for temporarily approving and officially sanctioning an LGBTQ student group, then later rescinding that approval. In this interview, Erin tells her side of the story and provides some further context into why this decision was reversed. This type of flip-flopping over LGBTQ affirmation has unfortunately happened before in evangelical circles. It occurred at World Vision. It happened during a contentious interview by Eugene Peterson and its aftermath. And now it's happened at Azusa Pacific. This interview was recorded in November 2018, and since then, two conservative board members at Azusa Pacific have resigned. Brave Commons does very powerful work. If you're able, please visit bravecommons.org to learn more, and donate if you can. As always, you can follow me on Twitter at BRChastain. You can follow the show on Twitter at ExvangelicalPod. There's also a large Facebook group, which can now be easily found at the URL facebook.com slash groups slash exvangelical. You can support the show via Patreon at patreon.com slash exvangelicalpod. And as always, please tell others about the show and leave a rating on Apple Podcasts. All right, let's get into it. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Exvangelical. My guest this week is Erin Green. She is the co-director of the Brave Commons for the California and Pacific Northwest region of the United States. Welcome to the show, Erin. Hi, Blake. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming on the show. Um, you, Your organization has been uh, in the news lately uh, in a couple of different places, uh, specifically in uh, in regards to some of your work on the campus of Azusa Pacific. So I'm very happy to, to talk to you about that. But before we get there, I want to hear a little bit more about yourself and what sort of led you to this point. Um, so let's just start uh, back at the beginning and, and learn a little bit about where you're from and what your sort of early religious formation and, and exposure was like. Sure. It's a lot to unpack, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to be succinct about it. Um, I'm, I'm from Los Angeles or L.A. proper. I've been uh, I was born in Southern California, raised there my whole life and born into evangelicalism. Um, mm-hmm. My family and or I grew up going to a non-denominational or ev- evangelical free church. Okay. And it was a, a core part of my childhood experience. All of my friends were from church and mm-hmm. all of our like family get togethers involved um, friends from church, and I was in vacation Bible schools and Sunday school, all the things. Mm-hmm. Um, I think things became noticeably concerning for me when I was around the age of 12 years old, and I was given a New Testament Bible that had sort of a a cultural or a modern cultural twist on things that were happening in the world today. And this Bible was geared toward young folks. Mm-hmm. It was mm-hmm. made for, I think it was called the King and the Beast. Oh, And it was a special Bible made for like, I don't know, around the people around the age of like 10 to 15. Um, so it addressed a lot of concerns or, or things that someone within those age ranges would go through. And then that sort of segued you into the Christian New Testament. Mm. 
right before you get to Matthew, it asks you to sign this pledge or ask Jesus into your heart kind of thing. Like a written out sinner's prayer sort of thing. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I was just immersed. I, I really enjoyed the reading for some reason. Mm -hmm. Um, because I was very interested in, in scripture and I loved God so much. I knew that. Um, but it did address homosexuality inside of this book. And that was, I think the first time, my first experience with like Christian teaching where it explicitly condemned, um, same sex attraction or same sex, you know, behavior of any Mm -hmm. sort. So I knew in that moment, uh, because I, I knew I was same sex attracted at that point, that that was going to be an ongoing, um, kind of concern. But it was also incidentally the same time that I did commit my life, you know, and how we all do in evangelicalism, I guess, where you say that special prayer and ask Jesus into your heart, that kind of thing, which, Mm -hmm. which I do consider to be a moment in my, it's definitely a moment in my life. I will never forget. I remember it very well, Mm -hmm. but it also has a lot of negative implications as well Mm -hmm. Uh, because there would be a lot of things from that upbringing and even just those little portions of that New Testament text that I read that I would have to deconstruct later on in my life. Mm-hmm. So I tried to basically go through all the motions that we do in the evangelical world. Um, and my biggest concern in getting older and being in high school and things like that was maintaining the imp- appearance of being straight because I knew I was not straight. There was That was something that no matter how hard I tried and how hard I prayed or uh, whatever on my knees and, you know, begging and crying out to God to change this about me inside that wasn't going away. That wasn't changing. Mm -hmm. So there was constant internal struggle and turmoil and grief, but also I was living this double life where it was like, I knew this, part about myself, but I was hiding it from everybody else and trying to be straight. I tried to be in relationships with men, um, and failed at those miserably, um, and broke a lot of hearts along the way. And then when I graduated high school, um, I had a moment in my life of a very dark period where I just rebelled hardcore and went straight to alcohol and even drug use. Mm-hmm. And it it ruined my life almost. Um, I'm I'm surprised sometimes, like when I think about the things that I did, and some of the consequences um, involved around like my alcohol abuse. Sometimes I'm surprised I'm even alive, but I am. And it was a it was a big enough wake up call for me to go, okay, this this isn't working um, because I was so conflicted. And battling with the the pulls from, you know, you can't be gay with, uh, but I still love God. And what do I do about that? So when I discovered through alcohol that that just took that all away, mm-hmm. that was sort of a remedy. It was a temporary and very harmful remedy, but it, it worked, um, you know, even if it was just for a few hours every night. It was a way for me to subdue and a way for me to console the inner t- turmoil going on inside of my heart and soul. Mm. And, but I'd wake up in the morning, you know, feeling awful and terrible and hungover mm. and having all of this remorse and shame and guilt. And so it never fixed anything. Nothing ever went away about my attraction. I was still attracted to women. And I would just repeat that cycle over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. Eventually it came to a head and I had to stop. So I pretty much walked away from the church and, um, I knew that there weren't any solutions, productive solutions coming out from the church because sure, the church can say, you cannot do this. Um, you have to be X, Y, Z in order to be acceptable before God. But the thing is, is that none of this, none of their prescriptions were providing any flourishing or thriving in my life or in anybody else's that I could see like they promised it would. 
Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you do this, if you if you do if you're obedient or whatever, you'll be flooded with the joy and love and mercy and grace of Christ. I didn't feel any of that. Right. Um, it wasn't until I completely walked away from all of that, got into, uh, you know, academics and biblical academics at that. I started to be able to deconstruct everything. And that was, this was when I was in my thirties, when I had returned to academia and I had the first time a, a, a clergy person affirmed me as a woman in Christian leadership and affirmed me as a gay Christian woman mm-hmm. for the first time in my thirties. So all up until that time, I had never been affirmed from my family, from friends, um, anything like that. So he, th- that was a special relationship that I had with that person who was a professor of um, Old and New Testament studies, my first year returning back to college. And he was also a retired Presbyterian minister and a PhD in New Testament studies. He's still my mentor today. Mm-hmm. So he went to the PCUSA denomination and, and was telling me these stories about the church there and kind of how things work there and that I might find a more affirming space in that kind of community. So I went to the PCUSA church and it changed my life. Um, That was the first time I ever felt comfortable fully being who I am in Mm -hmm. a church environment. Mm -hmm. So it took about over 30 years to get there Yeah, to ever feel comfortable in that space. Right. Um, So I don't identify at all as an evangelical. I think it's the F word pretty much. <laughs> um, so that's, that's my story about evangelicalism. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, you, you condensed a lot of experience in, into that, that telling. And um, if you don't mind, I, I have a, a couple of follow-up questions just to sort of tease out some of those things that you, that you mentioned. Um, oh. you, you talked about this sort of turmoil and, you know, maintaining this appearance of being straight, um, what sort of, so I, I know that you received this message from, from the new Testament that you received. Were you also receiving that through, through like your youth group or other spiritual leaders or other places? Um, was that being, um, was that being presented like homosexuality being sinful and being, being wrong in the eyes of God? Was that something that was taught at your taught at your church or or at other other places that you were receiving religious instruction? It it definitely was, and I I can't remember a specific instance of like in the church where I thought, oh my gosh, um, you know, this is blatantly clear. Although I know it happened because we're it, I look back at like Hans George Gadamer, you know, does this treatise on hermeneutics. And says that, you know, from birth, we're by thrownness, we're just thrown into tradition. Mm -hmm. Um, We're we're culturally shaped by heteronormativity, especially in the church. Mm -hmm. So if if you are not at a certain age, you know, dating a young man as as a woman or if if you go a long period without ever dating, Mm -hmm. you know, a boy or whatever, at least the so I'm speaking from my perspective, it's noticeable to the people within your culture and community. Right. So I remember receiving remarks like that and concern. And then I, you know, would, I would open up to my parents, um, or at least my mom, not my dad. And my mom would, you know, say, well, this is just a phase. It's something that all people experience, you know, that I even experienced when I was younger, but it'll go away. And, um, I just, because everyone else, what I thought was normative was heterosexuality. That is what I tried to do too. I tried to be like everybody else, but I knew that I wasn't. And so what I knew this wasn't going to work. And I brought it to the attention of some pastors, um, some people who I confided in, you know, in the church, they all, all of them were clear that being gay and living in, they would call it, you know, a lifestyle, Mm -hmm. um, was destructive and it would ultimately keep me separated from God. 
And that was, yeah, direct instruction that I received from pastors. Mm-hmm. And so I, I do know that, that um, just from our, dis- our discussions and, and other things you've, you've published lately, um, that you did attend uh, an evangelical college in Azusa Pacific. Um, I'm not sure actually whether it falls into the evangelical camp. Um, I'm, I, perhaps you can you can give uh, flesh that out for me. Um, but what sort of led you to throughout this period when you when you walk, when you had to disengage um, for your own health from Christian circles, particularly evangelical ones? Um, what led you back to wanting to study in an academic way? What was the, what was the draw there? The draw was I wasn't going to let anybody tell me that I could not be a biblical studies major as a woman or as Mm. a gay woman. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, my choices are limited in that vocation. So if I wanted to get a, a generalized like religious studies major, I could have gone to any university to do that. Mm-hmm. But I think you and I both know that if we want to specialize in the field of biblical studies where we're learning the original languages of the text, we're learning Hebrew, we're learning Greek, we're learning how to exegete, we're learning how to translate, we're learning all of the historical critical methods and, and methods of hermeneutics and things like that that you would never get at a at a at just a regular university. So I knew I had to be there. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to necessarily be there, but I wanted that degree because I wanted to change the way that this is spoken about. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I wanted to become an expert on the Bible, essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, not only because I wanted to like thwart the my my opponent's view, the non-affirming view, but because I truly believe that it is not the correct view and it's not the the loving view mm-hmm. of of you know proper exegesis and, and how we image forth an action out love. Um, so that's why I chose to go to an evangelical school. And I first went to Biola for a year, oh, okay. uh, which is pretty different from Azusa Pacific, which is not evangelical. It's more of a Wesleyan tradition. Okay. So there, there was quite a bit of difference between the universities academically and I could, I could sense that immediately as soon as I transferred. So the Wesleyan tradition at APU definitely opened up, you know, I think a more liberal, progressive, um, dynamic and robust kind of teaching than at Biola University. Within um, the, within so the I, religion departments? Um, yeah, or... so the, was that also, yes. was that also true more generally? Uh, I asked that be, just because um, some some listeners may know I went to Indiana Wesleyan, so it's also in the that Wesleyan tradition. And my experience right. was um, that actually it was the religion department that was um, I wouldn't call them progressive, but they uh, but they were more they were not as conservative as other departments like the history department that I was also a part of. Um, so I'm curious, just, uh, this is a very sort of inside baseball thing. Um, but sure. with, in regards to Azusa Pacific is, was that liberalism? Um, was it, was it something that was, uh, present in lots of different parts of both student life and the academic life, or was it particularly in that religion department and what you were studying there? It was particularly in, in the school of theology Oh, okay. because Yes. And, and I, do, I mean, I, I can, I can't speak for the other departments at APU because I was just immersed in school of theology, but mm-hmm. most of my professors were affirming. Outwardly. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. Um, yes. So, so we actually had, um, with the recent demonstrations that took place at APU, there were a lot of professors involved in that. And I've been receiving, um, support on the outside from my biblical studies profs at APU. Um, they just, are scared to death of getting fired, <laughs> you know, if they come out publicly. Right. Yes. And that, but, that is a threat to, for a lot of right. evangelical professors. It absolutely is. But I, I think they, they did. My impression was that they definitely held fast to the Wesleyan tradition, you know, reason, experience, scripture and tradition, as opposed mm-hmm. to Biola university, which I, this was the one, uh, one of the most noticeable things to me when I when I left was 
in the School of Theology at Biola University, as required textbooks, they often have this sort of incestual recirculation of other Biola profs books Mm -hmm. as required texts. Mm -hmm. Azusa Pacific was completely different. They were using outside, you know, texts, not just their own APU, like published works by those professors. But that seemed to be the sole, like, form of required textbook requirement, like at Biola University, was other Biola profs books. Mm -hmm. So there's this constant circulation of the same messaging, the same ideas, you know, it's just like almost robotic, Mm -hmm. you know. It's very different at APU. Yeah, interesting. That I'm. I'm glad you. I'm personally very glad that you had that experience and that you found Me too. Uh, affirming places and a, uh, an affirming mentors and professors and that sort of thing. And in this particular institution, um, was this also around the same time that that you are um, a co-director of an of an organization called the Brave Commons? Um, what got you connected to, to what led to your connection with them? And could you tell us a little bit about the work of your organization? Sure. So I, um, because of the work I had been doing in the, the academic year of 2017, 2018 at Azusa Pacific, which was my final year there, um, based on all the other work I, I did as an LGBTQ activist at Biola University, and the negotiations I was in with APU's admin and in working for nonprofits and being an organizer, it just it dawned on me that the one thing that we were missing within this sort of field was a, a centralized location or a centralized organization that united and converged LGBTQ student groups across the country that were at these Christian universities. Mm-hmm. Now other attempts have been made to do this. But for various reasons, they didn't work like the infrastructure was not done properly or maybe the political climate wasn't great. Um, the timing was perfect for this to happen. So hmm. I heard about what Michael was doing, Michael Vasquez, um, because I actually heard I, I read in an article what happened at Hope College where they they um, fake nailed a, a thesis, basically telling them how being non-affirming um, was totally harmful and damaging to the students and its community at Hope University. And there was this big, um, I mean, Michael was approached by, sorry, did you hear that? No, it's, it's good. It's, okay. it, it just adds to the ambiance. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All, all the social media is going off. Yeah, exactly. I thought, it's, I thought it's I all good. my notifications off. <laughs> uh, oh my goodness. Let me change that very quickly. Okay. So anyway, I apologize, but I, so I heard of Michael's work, his direct involvement at activism at Hope College with the students, uh, LGBTQ students being oppressed there, his interaction with, I think, police and administration who were um, handling him improperly. And, and then the work that he was doing at Wheaton and sort of, merging together the reformation project with, with those things. And I thought we need to combine our efforts Mm. and rather than being, you know, I keep reading these random articles from local sources, local news sources about X, Y, Z college in this state where an LGBTQ thing happened. Um, but no one, it doesn't, it doesn't go any further than that. And if you don't know, or if you're unaware about what's happening on these universities, there's really no way that you're going to see this information unless you're kind of in the circle that we're in. So um, through one of our mutual friends, we decided to basically converge our work and unite Mm. our work. I thought, I'm doing what you're doing, but I'm doing it on the West Coast. You're doing it in the Midwest. Let's find someone on the East Coast and let's bring all of our work together and like make this dynamic awesome, powerful force that empowers these students in these spaces where they're oppressed. And that's basically what happened. And we decided to go with a flattened hierarchy and um, just call ourselves co-executive directors of this movement of faith and justice. Mm -hmm. And 
that's what we're doing. So let's, I'd love to, to really sort of articulate for folks that don't have this direct experience um, with being part of the LGBTQ community on a Christian campus, in particular an evangelical Christian campus, and sort of the, the things that a queer Christian um, faces on sort of just on a, on a day-to-day basis. This is um, something that sp- speaking from my own experience, you know, you tend to spend most of your time on campus with the same people. Uh, most of them are, many of them are smaller. So, you, you, you know, you're recognized, even if everyone doesn't know you, at least you're recognized. Um, and a lot of times there's forced religious activities, <laughs> Um, like chapels and things like that. So what sort of things become challenges for LGBTQ Christians on these campuses? Yeah, there's there's a ton of challenges, and, and they're not necessarily so obvious mm-hmm. to the public um, or even obvious to the student uh, who who thinks that this is normative language that, that's coming from a professor or coming from a chapel um, pastor or something like that. So what what definitely happens is overt and um, microaggressions, and this could come from a professor delivering a lecture on something that has nothing to do with homosexuality, but somehow, some way, their point of view is going to get merged into this lecture. It happened to me several times while I was at Biola, and, um, you know, it could otherwise go on a way, you know, not note is not noticed at all. It could just be like, oh, this is how we think about this particular community. And this is the way we treat it. But to me, when these things were presented, um, and lectured about at Biola, I could, it was like lightning was striking everywhere. I was like, oh my God, how, how dare you say something like this in a class? Like this is an academic institution. This is not a church. Like we have chapel time, but so there's typically for that student, not much of a separation between like an environment like chapel, what we would expect that to look like Mm -hmm. versus the classroom, which is very interesting. So these students are immersed in a constant culture of heteronormativity. And if you're not in compliance with that, like the consequences run the gamut. It could be, you, you know, you're threatened with your scholarships. You're threatened with to lose financial aid. Mm-hmm. You're threatened to receive counseling. Um, you're you're basically forced to take X Y Z steps in order to be quote unquote compliant with uh, university policies. Mm-hmm. And, Um, Sometimes those things can become so severe that at some Christian universities, they will do reparative therapy practices on campus. Mm. Uh, So it just it just depends where on where and whether or not it's legal to perform that there or um, on all sorts of factors. But generally, it's it's like the environment I described when I was growing up is that you are forced to fit into a culture of heteronormativity. And that is the the perfect vision, the paradigmatic vision that you're supposed to fit into. If you don't, something is wrong. You'll receive counseling. You'll receive discipline or something like that, something along those lines. That is the constant experience of the LGBTQ person or a queer person on this campus. Um, so they feel the the immediate effects of that are feelings of isolation, anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation. There's propensity for alcohol and drug abuse, um, substance abuse in general. Like it, this is clinically and, and um, statistically proven that these are the direct results of that kind of non-affirming um, communication coming from these universities mm-hmm. onto students. And what sort of ways have LGBTQ Christian students on these campuses? How have they? 
um, historically or even now sort of sought one another out or tried to support one another while in these environments? So what happens then is we've seen this movement of underground LGBTQ groups pop up. Mm -hmm. And there's one at Liberty University. And we don't know who the students are necessarily, but we know that they're there. Obviously, we can't make the assumption. And one of one of the worst assumptions that like heteronormative people make is that everyone is heterosexual. Obviously, that's not true. Liberty is is full of queer people. Viola is full of queer people. So is Azusa Pacific. So what tends to happen is like they have to create these sort of subversive movements where they come together together whether it's off campus or these um, little pockets of safety in community. And that's how it all starts is it takes like one person and that one person tells their friend and, and there you go, you have two people. And then you start a movement, iron sharpens iron pretty much, you know? Mm-hmm. And they, they start out as this underground sort of like maybe a Bible study group or something like that. But then it it grows into a space of safe, loving community where they protect one another, protect one another's anonymity, safety, all the things. I mean, it's it's really a beautiful space of love and protection. Hmm. And you are part of an effort at Zeus Pacific in particular. There was an organization that was an underground organization. And this has been this is something that's been covered in the news um, that was called Haven that at one point earlier this year, Azusa Pacific did ex- essentially endorse, um, but then they later retracted that endorsement very quickly. Um, can you give us some detail about what happened there and sort of the, ram- the ramifications of this flip-flopping that happened on the students that that participated, their morale, their own... Um, their own sense of security and yeah, let's, let's just start there. Sure. Um, I mean, to preface my work at APU, I, I led the underground movement at Biola university. So it was, um, Biola's equal ground and formerly known as the Biola queer underground. So I already have experience going when I transferred into Azusa Pacific, I didn't intend on being an active, like, a person within the underground movement at APU, but I did offer my help as a, as a person experienced in negotiations and just wanted to make sure that they were okay and could see if I wanted to see if I could lend my help in any possible way to bolster them and support them. So I started out with the, the leader at the time of the underground movement had never met the president of APU so I made sure that that meeting happened. It started off with a meeting with uh, President John Wallace at the time and the chaplain, uh, Kevin Minoya. And what resulted from that was a series of several conversations, discussions, and meetings um, with members of the Board of Trustees, other members of Azusa Pacific's administration, and Reverend Kevin Minoya, the chaplain of APU, invited outside LGBTQ organizations to come to APU to listen to queer student stories. And the, the purpose, as explained by Azusa Pacific, was for, for the school to have to do a better job at loving and accepting the LGBTQ community on its campus. This is how it was presented to us that they wanted to do better as Christians. They wanted, they wanted to welcome this community, to love them, embrace them. And so I was in meetings with Equality California, another organization um, who's affiliated with the NCAA, which APU is a part of, that's a queer um, supporting organization. And we shared our stories. We, we became very vulnerable before people we don't even know in administration on the board of trustees. And we told them how much pain 
um, that this experience in evangelical Christianity has caused us, how much pain the language of these policies caused us, how much pain we receive by overt um, microaggressions or overt and microaggressions happening in a lecture or just in passing or by a student who who happens to be non-affirming and says something, you know, really awful about the LGBTQ community. In addition, there were students who have been actually disciplined and threatened to lose their scholarships and removed from their positions in student government at Azusa Pacific. And um, when they, w- it was found out that they were in a same-sex relationship. And then APU also has a legacy of firing a professor who identified as transgender, even though that that professor had a a PhD in their field as a theologian and identified as Christian. So we we express the wounds from the history of what APU has done before its administration, before the Board of Trustees, and before these outside organizations that were invited. Mm -hmm. And the, the posture of the school was one of humility. It was one of remorse. They felt awful for us, or at least that was the impression that we had. They gave us the impression that this was unacceptable. They gave us the impression that the language and the policies were unacceptable, that they were, um, they were harmful and discriminatory. They were holding us to double, it was a double standard. You know, we weren't held to the same standards as our peers. So they said out of their mouths, we are going to get rid of the policy which bans same-sex relationships. There's no need for it to be there. And I echoed this sentiment. I said, this is my, this was my pitch in the negotiations was that you are for no reason negative, negatively stigmatizing our community um, just because you want to make everyone know that you're anti-LGBTQ for some reason. And I made the point that if your requirement is that all students remain abstinent before before marriage, that's all you need to have. You don't need to have anything about same-sex relationships because that's your standard. All students do this before they're married. And then marriage is a separate topic. That was the point, and they agreed. So they looked us in the eye. Mem- these members of administration and said, we're going to get rid of this policy. It's a It's a... It's an ag- aggression toward the LGBTQ community. So they got rid of the policy, and it was actually gone for a month. That's what a lot of people get confused about with the media and the news stories. Oh, they wow. think it was only for a week. The policy was dropped for a month. So that those were the main, like, I was directly involved in every single discussion and negotiation directly with administration and some of the board members. I was very intimately involved in this. That's why I was a I personally took offense to what happened here at Azusa Pacific. Hmm. And I know that well, it's hard hard to know exactly where to go immediately after that, after hearing that story. Um I do know that one of the things that that in reading some of the some of the coverage after they reversed their decision is that they meant that one of the justifications was is that the board had in fact not approved this. Are they referring to a different type of board than the board of trustees, or is that just simply not the not the case? No, it's the board of trustees, and that's that I find that to be pretty unbelievable because the president of the university is a member of the board of trustees and he, and John Wallace knew about this and to, to say, well, you know, you did something without us knowing, or you did something we didn't approve of directly implicates the fact that their leadership, their communication is obviously not going through the proper channels. They're not executing it properly. And the ones who suffer ultimately are the LGBTQ students. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones who suffer because of whatever happened here. Um, I, I don't believe for a second that the board didn't know about this. I think they knew full well about this. 
I think as soon as as soon as we publicized it from the end of Brave Commons and it took off like wildfire, the school wasn't expecting that to happen. The school wanted this whole thing to fly under the radar. They wanted to drop the policy and just everybody shut up about it. Mm-hmm. Well, we didn't do that. We made it public. It was a win for us. And as soon as it was publicized and it got circulated in the media, that's when conservative constituents and donors and other folks started threatening to pull funds to pull funds and to pull um, their status from the CCCU, an organization of Christian colleges. Mm-hmm. So APU was being threatened by very powerful like organizations for doing this, and that's when the board a month later, decided to reinstate the policy. And then after they reinstated it, we all received another email because we we still get emails as alumni that the school also just so happened to be $17 million in debt Mm. at the close of uh, the 2018 spring semester. So there is obviously money, um, you know, like the the financial factor is huge here. They yeah. were they were going to lose a ton of money from this, and that's probably the biggest reason why they reinstated the policy. Mm. Mm-hmm. And that was that was learned after the fact. What's that? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You said that was learned after the fact. The the financial state of the university. It was interesting that so when the board of trustees notified everybody that the policy was reinstated a couple of days later they also notified alumni and students that they were 17 million dollars in debt Mm. um so it was just easy for us at brave commons and and every other organizer who knows you know why these things happen the way they do that money was definitely a factor in this a big factor so we knew APU's motto is God first, and everybody's been saying, "Well, if your if your motto is God first, why would you um, affirm homosexuality?" But you know, our our retort, our reply to that is, "It's it's it's never about God first; it's about money first. So, and that's that's clearly what the board of trustees and the administration have shown and displayed. And to take it one step further, I had a discussion with the Reverend, the Kevin Manoya after the board reinstated the ban and I asked him, you know, what happened? Like, how could you do this to us? Um, and, and then I asked him for an apology. I said, you owe these students an apology. The, the board of trustees and administration need to have a posture of humility and, and, you know, display some, sincerity over how this may have tremendously impacted them and hurt them. And he replied to me, that's not going to happen. That's exactly what he said. Like they had, at that point, they just, they didn't care about the way, about the way any of the students felt. It was about covering their asses at that point because it had, it had just gone so far in the media that it Mm. was, you know, they had to put out all those fires. And we were no longer a priority. Mm. <sighs> Since then, you have made many, you've made outreach to different media outlets to b- draw attention to this. Uh, you've also, this week, um, started a petition on change.org uh, for Azusa Pacific to uh, again reverse the ban. Could you go into a little bit of detail as far as um, what, what you would like to do through that petition and how how um, you wish to garner support? Um, there's a couple of components to that. So our documents recent, recently released through Brave Commons, our letter of grievances and action that we plan to take is actually buttressing a piece of legislation that was passed through the Student Government Association recently at Azusa Pacific. So what these students who are so brilliant and and amazing did was they used their own form of government within the university system to pass a piece of legislation which forces the Board of Trustees to 
to either drop the policy or to clarify the language. So they're they're noting that the ambiguous language of you know romanticized same sex relationships, and also the the university not listing the consequences or repercussions for engaging in whatever romanticized means. So this piece of legislation passed inside the school by a lot of LGBTQ students and um, allies, ally students, is is something that will force the board to do something no matter what. What we wanted to do externally was work and co-author a, a draft, a finalized draft with these students that in addition to what they wrote and what was passed in the Student Government Association, we added violations of accreditation standards to our list. Mm. So we wanted to let Azusa Pacific University know that they had violated accreditation regulation standards uh, through WASC, which is an accrediting body. And we also wanted to let them know that, that we were going to seek our um, protection of civil li- civil liberties um, in any way we can, because many of these universities are Title IX exempt or they have, you know, special privileges and things like that. There aren't very many protections for LGBTQ students. So that was the reason for the external buttressing of what the students were already doing inside. A large part of our work is really doing what the students want. So Mm. I think uh, I want to make that clear. We want to do what they want and we want to uphold um, their desires because ultimately they're the ones who have to live on this campus. Right. And they're the ones who like experience the day to day. So, as a part of our action, in addition to what the students are doing, we will file a WASC complaint. Um, and I'm going to be doing this as a alumni or alumna and the person, one of the people who was directly involved in these discussions and felt the aftermath of, you know, what had happened in the exploitation of our community by the leaders at Azusa Pacific. Mm-hmm. Um, What's even scarier and frightening that a lot of people don't really know about unless they're sort of into this kind of stuff is that coalition of Christian schools that I talked about earlier, which APU is a part of, and so is Biola University, along with several other Christian universities across the country. They are lobbying the Department of Education right now to have exemptions from accreditation regulations and standards. This means that all of the accrediting bodies that regulate how a a university functions might potentially be changed, (laughs) which the purpose of this is to be able to further discriminate against LGBTQ students who may just, you know, just so happen to be in these spaces, Mm -hmm. but accreditation protections are some of the last protections that any of these students have. So we're making it a point at Brave Commons to file this WASP complaint as soon as possible before anything is done, you know, at the Department of Education, because this is in the works right now. And those discussions are also something that Brave Commons is a part of with the Department of Education where that's sort of the underlying story to all of this mm-hmm. that we're also involved in. Yeah. So And that's yeah. I'm I'm sure that's very a very urgent concern because Betsy DeVos is in favor would be in favor of these sorts of things. She has exactly. deep deep connections to um Christian education um and would be in favor of granting those exemptions. So that is Definitely a, a frightening possibility for LGBTQ students in these campuses. Um, that actually leads into a sort of thing that I saw uh, surfaced um, on just recently online yesterday. Um, I actually promoted the petition um, because I do su- I support you. your work, um, and I think it's it's very important and very valid. Um, there was someone that that you know. It, saw the remark on Twitter um, and actually asked a question about why do LGBTQ persons go to these Christian colleges um, if they, I 
gave what I thought was at least an initial response that it was it can be complicated sometimes they have to go because of family reasons that sort of thing um but they just said something a little bit uh I mean they, they just said very a little glibly like okay then refuse um but what is the sort of reality for uh for LGBTQ students in these spaces um and can you sort of speak to why these persons that are at risk and discriminated against in these in, in these communities why they are a part of them um because sure. yeah because it is something that that is not easy um but i think giving that perspective would be really really helpful for some listeners who may hear this that that just don't have that lived experience themselves and and need to be able to understand it a little bit better. Sure. Yes. And just uh, prior, to, I I didn't answer or finish the answer from the last question. Oh, sure. Go yes, ahead. We, we we did have we do have the public petition attached to our um, letter of grievances, like you mentioned, and you are supporting on Twitter and thank you for that. And it has, um, I think we're a little over 2,500 signatures at this point and it's only been out for a couple of days. That's great. So, um, thank you for that. And to answer your question, why do LGBTQ students end up in Christian schools? Okay. My, I tried when people ask me this question, um, at first I was being really patient with them. Now, when people ask this question, my patience is um, lessened. And here's why. I'm going to answer the question. There's a couple of responses, and one of them is the one that you said. But that is the wrong question to be asking. We should never ask, why are LGBTQ students in these spaces? It's not their fault that they're in any of these spaces. Mm -hmm. We can liken that to sort of a Jim Crow kind of understanding of why do black people eat at a restaurant that's only for white people um, when they can just go to a restaurant that's for blacks or, you know, something, something along those lines. And I'm not liking, likening this to a racial issue. I'm liking it to how we treat other people and how we view certain communities. So the reasons why LGBTQ students are in these spaces is because that these private Christian institutions offer some pretty sizable scholarships to just about anybody. Mm. If you have a pretty good academic record. Um, And that is very enticing for a lot of students who are financially struggling or even for their parents. And I don't know very many 18 to 24 year olds who are financially independent from their families or do who do not need financial aid or who do not need scholarships. Mm -hmm. And when you have a private Christian university waving potentially a, almost a full ride scholarship in your face, you're going to take it. Mm -hmm. If you, if you've grown up in a Christian tradition, a lot of that shapes the way that um, these students are thinking. And like you said, that sort of, family tradition and environment also goes into it. So if a family member or parents, if they have financial power over the student to determine where they go, and if it's the parent's preference for the student to go to a Christian university, where do you think that that 18 year old is going to end up going? Mm -hmm. Probably to the university that the the parents are willing to pay for. Um, Because again, you know, someone who's 18, 19, 20, they don't have the financial resources to go to, you know, to live on campus. And there's so many fees, housing fees, um, health fees, you know, all kinds of things. So it's not necessarily about like, um, you know, queer students just infiltrating these universities. That's not the case at all. Right. They're also many of these students are Christians. So this is like saying, you know, we don't want you in these spaces. If you're queer or LGBTQ, we don't want you here, even though, we'll, you know, we'll take your money, but just shut up about your orientation mm. and you better mm-hmm. follow the rules. Okay. So I think we, the better question to ask 
is how can we do a better job of loving and supporting LGBTQ students who are most likely people of faith of some sort, if they've been able to hold on to that at all, Mm -hmm. despite their traumatic experiences. But the last part of your, your question, the answer to that is many students don't even make that discovery of coming out until they're in college. Mm -hmm. And then you're really right. Because Mm -hmm. you're already in this space. You, you're already paying. You already live there. Maybe you live on campus and let's say you're 19 years old and you're starting to discover and come to terms with the fact that you might be gay and you have no one to turn to. You can't tell your friends. You can't tell your pastors. You can't tell your family. They're not safe to come out to. This is the experience by and large of the LGBTQ student at a Christian university. Mm-hmm. It's not like these students are saying, oh, I'm gay. I really want to go to a Christian college to like fuck things up. No, my God, that's the last thing that we're thinking. And that's the last kind of thing we want to do to ourselves. These students are discovering, oh my gosh, I think I'm gay. Or, oh my gosh, I think I might be transgender. And what do I do? And mm-hmm. then they find them in this like really scary, frightening, isolating moment in space. They have no one to go to. And that is precisely why these groups are popping up is to protect students and keep them alive. Because otherwise, if they come out, they risk their life, you know, because if their family is not affirming, if their, you know, university is not affirming, they are screwed. Mm -hmm. And it could be very safe for them to do this. Mm -hmm. So, that is my answer to that question. I hope, I hope that people really start re-examining, like, why am I asking this question? Is that the right question to ask? Right. I, yes, I, I, I love the way you answered that. I think it's... Thank you. Thank you for that answer. <laughs> I, I think... I, the, it's, it's the number one question I get asked. Yeah. From I, everyone. Right. Yeah, because I... And I I know that, you know, there's always this discussion about whether we live in our own sort of bubbles and it it does, you know, these are communities like these LGBTQ communities that are embedded in conservative Christian colleges. They do not live in their own bubble. You know, they do not live in a place of comfort. And so that I think that that that's a question that that needs that sort of answer. And I'm glad that you Absolutely. that you uh, that 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 you answered it so frankly and forthrightly, uh, and I, I think that's yeah. very very powerful. Um, what what else is is Brave Commons working towards, and and what what other sorts of ways can people that are that are also in the LGBT community that allies or those that support or, or want to stand beside um, these communities, how can they help brave comments? How can they help the people in their lives? Um, I'd, I'd love to sort of wrap things up and, and sort of get your thoughts about uh, with, around that and, and where things are going now. Cause I, I do think you're right. I think what you said earlier at the beginning of the conversation is that this is, this feels like the, the time is different. It, Feels like the the people that I've met online that are working and doing this sort of this sort of very very honest very vulnerable work. Um, you're finding your own voices. You're finding your own communities. You're not staying silent. All those things through social media and other outlets uh, is making this sort of thing possible. Um, what is what do you see as the work in this moment and the the work in the future? Well, besides the stuff that we're doing at Azusa Pacific University, we have received a ton of um, requests for help from students all over the United States attending Christian colleges. So what's, what's been really cool is, is because like Michael, myself and I, and or myself, Michael and I and Lauren have all been at different conferences you know, the Reformation Project Conference. I was at another one in Colorado where we've been sort of hearing this outcry from students in even more dangerous situations than 
um, I don't, I don't want to put levels of danger, but there are definitely Christian universities that have uh, more severe um, restrictions and, and like damage levels like Liberty university, for instance, in Lynchburg. Um, so we are in the midst of that's kind of what unfortunately a lot of people are not seeing is, is a, we're directly working with those students as well all over the country and we're providing them with pastoral care and other resources local to them that was another thing we we really wanted to specialize in and be unique in that way was all of us have um knowledge in pastoral care and also in like theology, biblical theology and things like that. And we can speak to those components for those students if they wish, mm-hmm. um, in addition to us helping them kind of organize these groups. But providing them local resources is detrimental. So if you know an L- uh, LGBTQ student who's attending a Christian university or anything like that, and you can provide a safe house or a safe church, or a safe Bible study, you know, to invite these students to, um, that is, is one of the best ways if you, if you know someone, um, but also you can let us know at bravecommons.org if you are supporting of a particular uh, group that may be at a Christian college near you. So if you're in Colorado or Denver and you live near Colorado Christian University and you're a safe and affirming church, we, sh- we definitely want to know that. Um, and that's, that's one way that you can reach out to us. So we, we try to sort of imagine, you know, the old operators sitting at the, the board with all their little, I don't know what those things are called, the, the wires that they have to. Oh, put like in switchboards. And it's called switchboards. Yeah. So yeah. We, Brave Commons in a sense is a giant switchboard. Mm. We, we want to connect the right, people to these students so that everybody can um, live in happy, queer, loving, Jesus, loving harmony together. (laughs) (laughs) But we, you know, there's a lot of churches and even other spaces outside of church that do things for these communities. And we want to connect everybody together because community is one of the ways um, and coming together is one of the ways that we're able to to tear down these systems of oppression. So um, that's some of the other work that we're doing. So if you're also a student listening to this or an alumni of a Christian university and want to help or get involved, we're at bravecommons.org. We're also on every single social media thing there is, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Brave Commons. And um, our biggest need right now is um, really funding support and every Every dollar that we use goes directly toward us spending specific quality time with students at these universities, whether it's over the phone or in person or some kind of consultation or, um, you know, we we are all on a shoestring budget and activists typically are. We're not in this for the money. We're in it for the work. Um, But we need help in, in being able to to do that work so that we can uplift these students. Mm. Yeah, and it's it's very good and very powerful work, and I'm glad that that you and Lauren and Michael are are really going after it and and doing this work. It is a great service and uh, ministry to these these students that that desperately need it. Um, thank you so much for sharing a bit about what's happening um, right now w- with your with your work with Azusa Pacific and the other work that you're doing. Um, where can people find you online? Where can they find more information about Brave Commons? Sure. Um, so I'm on all the social media things. Um, usually my handles are running errands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you could you could find me there. But Brave Commons, um, our website is bravecommons.org. And we are also available on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Brave Common. Great. And um, it's a great way to, yeah, you can get connected with, with us there. We have newsletters that go out each week with ways to help in specific areas. Um, and we give all of, like, student-specific information, university-specific information, and we're very detailed and 
Uh, we're still getting like some kinks uh, and more content put on our website, but we're we're a young group and we're grassroots, and we'll ha- have all of it up soon. Great, Aaron. Thank you so much for for talking to me today and sharing a bit of your story and what you're what you're working on. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having an interest in what we're doing. I really appreciate you using this amazing platform to help uplift um, people who need help. That means a lot to us. Of course, it's, it's my pleasure. Thank you again. Thanks, Blake.